Good afternoon, everyone. Great to see so many of you here, despite the uh, challenges of uh, power outages and traffic tie-ups. But the NIH community is clearly all abuzz this afternoon with the opportunity to hear from one of the world's leaders in an area of enormous current interest, uh, and that is uh, stem cell research. And particularly, uh, George Daly, uh, our speaker, uh, is going to present uh, to us uh, some new and exciting data, some of which you might have seen a little buzz about in the last few days, about uh, some new information about induced pluripotent stem cells, and I think you're in for a really interesting and informative scientific seminar. Uh, George is the Samuel E. Lux IV Professor of Hematology. Uh, he's also the director of the Stem Cell Transplantation Program at Children's Hospital. And he is professor of biological chemistry and molecular pharmacology and pediatrics, that's a lot, at Harvard Medical School. Uh, he has uh, obtained the MD and the PhD uh, from Harvard and MIT, respectively. And then after internship in medicine and uh, postdoctoral fellowship, all of those in Boston, uh, has been a very productive faculty member uh, since that time. In including a uh, appointment as an investigator in the Howard Hughes Medical Institute as of 2008. He's been elected to the ASCI and the AAP, and we at NIH are particularly proud of being able to point to the fact that he was one of the first Pioneer Award winners from our first class in 2004, and we point to his achievements and that of some of those other Pioneer Awardees as an indication of what a successful program that has turned out to be. Uh, he is uh, not only someone who has led the scientific enterprise in stem cells, uh, George has been very much willing to spend some of his time as well in the public policy aspects of this, has been an articulate uh, and effective uh, interface uh, in terms of talking with the public, with the Congress, with other decision makers about what the opportunities are here and also about important policy considerations. He's been a real friend to NIH over the course of the past few years. He came and spoke uh, to the Institute directors at a recent uh, leadership forum, uh, which was a, a wonderful opportunity to be able to pick his brain. He continues to be uh, very helpful in advising us about our plans uh, to, in the intramural program here, make a real focus on induced pluripotent stem cells uh, by the recruitment of a director uh, for a center that will focus particularly on the efforts to take this really exciting science in the direction of clinical applications. So George, we're really grateful for the time and effort you've put into advising us, and we're thrilled that you're here today. Please welcome George Daly. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Don't forget Dev2 study section. <laughs> um, it's, it's always an absolute thrill to come to NIH. Uh, I have to say that uh, you know, every time coming into Washington is just very, very special. And I, I felt a real sense of excitement when I met with uh, a number of your postdocs for lunch uh, that there are new and creative ways that the community is thinking about exploiting this new and incredibly exciting technology around uh, cellular engineering and induced pluripotency. And my goal today is to tell a number of stories about how we are approaching the biology of reprogramming and pluripotency and using it uh, to model disease, but initially to explore this fascinating biology of turning a cell back from its specialized state uh, into a reprogrammed pluripotent cell. But I'll also talk about some of the lessons we've learned about the limitations of disease modeling and the fact that there are still valuable lessons to be learned from modeling using embryonic stem cells and indeed valuable lessons to be learned from reprogramming through somatic cell nuclear transfer. So the stem cell concept has found its way into medicine for decades. Hematopoietic stem cell transplantation is one of the great triumphs of modern biomedicine and indeed we have curative therapies, but there are significant limitations and applications outside of the hematopoietic system are limited, and I think that's where much of the promise of stem cells are. The real boost to the field came in 1998 when Jamie Thompson's group isolated human embryonic stem cells, 
a pluripotent cell, the cell with the potential to become any tissue in the body, and therefore offer previously inaccessible approaches to linking gene function to tissue formation, creating a buzz in the pharmaceutical industry that one might have novel cell-based therapies or novel approaches to toxicity testing using real human cells. But of course, much of the long-term ambition is to move beyond the in vitro tools to actually create cells for transplantation. So if it's taken the better part of the 20th century for chemistry to be turned to the service of medicine, that is, the production of small molecules and their delivery as drugs, I think part of the excitement of the next 100 years, and it really may take much of the 21st century, is to be able to harness cells as medicines. Now, embryonic stem cells, which we've now had for the past decade or more, are really generic tools, and they do facilitate research on generic issues. But much of what I'll talk about today is the long-term ambition of stem cell research, which is to capture the ability to make customized and patient-specific stem cells. Now, when I was at the Whitehead Institute, my laboratory collaborated with Rudolf Janisch on a proof of principle that we could indeed capture the sort of dual technologies of somatic cell nuclear transfer to create uh, a patient-specific tissues. I hesitate to use the word cloning, but here we're talking about cloning cells. And technology for directed differentiation of these pluripotent cells into a tissue of interest, in, the, in this case, the hematopoietic stem cell. So in this case, our patient is an immune deficient RAG2 knockout mouse, a, a model of human omen syndrome, severe combined immune deficiency. And using tail tip cloning, uh, technologies that had been pioneered by Teru Wakayama, where literally one simply clips the tip of the tail of the mouse, cultures tail tip fibroblasts, and then performs nuclear transfer into an enucleated egg, the recipient o ooplasm acts upon the incoming somatic nucleus in a way not dissimilar from the way it would actively demethylate the incoming sperm pronucleus and ready it for genome activation. One generates this pseudozygote, can artificially activate, and one develops an embryo from which you can derive nuclear transfer ES cells. Now, these cells would carry the gene defect of the parent, and through homologous recombination, one can quite readily perform gene correction. We demonstrated in this experiment that the gene-repaired stem cells could generate a cloned mouse, which had an entirely intact immune system. But in a proof of principle, we then differentiated these into hematopoietic stem cells, engrafted the mouse, and restored partial immune function. It was partial circa 2002. We're now in a position where we can affect complete hematopoietic engraftment from mouse embryonic or induced pluripotent stem cells. But we're still limited because we are required to genetically modify these cells to drive engraftment. And one of the great goals of our lab and, and, and I would embrace for the community is to learn how to direct the formation of hematopoietic stem cells in a completely genetically pristine manner, both from mouse and human uh, pluripotent uh, derivatives. Now, our hope in the early part of the last decade was that we could affect the same kind of proof of principle using human cells and human nuclear transfer. But indeed, this has never been successful, in part because human oocytes are in short supply, but I think in large part because this is a very cumbersome and challenging strategy. I don't think it was ever a practical alternative for modeling a large number of diseases. I think our hope all along was that it would teach us the principles of reprogramming in such a way that we could get to the more direct and facile uh, method of direct reprogramming. And this was, in fact, the substance of my original application as an NIH uh, uh, Pioneer Award uh, grantee. And during the time that we were attempting to affect reprogramming of spermatogonial stem cells, which are really unipotent stem cells quite closely aligned with the, the, their pluripotent brethren, the work of Shinya Yamanaka came forward and really revolutionized the field. Now, what Shinya had realized was that there were a small set of genes among the many hundreds that are specific to the embryonic stem cell 
that confer this property of pluripotency, the ability of this cell to maintain a naive epigenome in such a way that it could give rise to various tissues under different conditions. And he winnowed from a large set of candidates a highly selected mini library, which could be delivered en masse as a, as a, as a, as a retroviral screen and with titers such that essentially you would affect the expression of any combination of those 24 factors. And he introduced these into an embryonic fibroblast, which was a fortuitous choice because these are the easiest cells to reprogram. And he engineered in that fibroblast a reporter system which allowed him to select for ES-like cells. And then in another brilliant embodiment of this experiment, it was reproduced 24 times, leaving a single candidate out in each bin, such that the four bins which failed identified the essential genes, which when brought together in this reprogramming experiment, were alone sufficient to drive pluripotency. And these now famous genes, OC4, SOX2, KLF4, and MYC, have since been modified. You can do it with NANOG, you can do it with LIN28, you can substitute LMIC for NMIC, you can substitute various SOX family members. There are cocktails now which can drive this reprogramming. Now with refinements from Shinya's lab as well as that of Conrad Hockedlinger and Rudolf Janisch, we were able to produce bona fide pluripotent cells which satisfied the functional criteria of embryonic stem cells, that is they could chimerize the mouse embryo, generate contributions to all tissues and be transferred through the germline. And then with this publication, which was in late 2006, it then became clear that we had to test whether these factors were sufficient to induce pluripotency in human cells. And indeed, it's a testimony to the robustness of this platform that just a little more than a year later, there were three groups that reproduced direct human somatic cell reprogramming, and then very quickly thereafter, this spread to, I would say, dozens of groups. So today, we have improved technologies and approaches to reprogramming, whereas most groups have used dermal fibroblasts from a skin biopsy, a number of groups, our own included, has recently published that from a simple 10cc venipuncture sample that could be drawn in any office, you can directly reprogram from the mononuclear cells of blood and generate a patient-specific iPS cell. So early on, we did this in a proof of concept to generate a repository of disease-specific lines, and just our initial production included the classical ADA immune deficiency, which is uh, uh, well studied here and, and used in gene therapy, Gaucher's uh, models of muscular dystrophy, uh, chromosomal uh, abnormalities like Downs, genetically more complex conditions like Parkinson's and diabetes, and this list is increasing at Harvard and, and internationally. Uh, at Harvard, we've established the Harvard Stem Cell Institute, IPS Core Laboratory. My colleagues Doug Melton, Chad Cowan, Conrad Hockedlinger, um, Kevin Egan, and others are contributing to this core. There's been an enormous appetite in the scientific community for using these cells. This has been distributed to, I believe now, almost 200 different laboratories. So what I'd like to do is, is illustrate uh, a couple of examples of, of how we're using these, uh, these stem cells to, uh, to, to have a fresh approach to uh, time-honored questions. Here's the work of Kevin Egan and colleagues, where he's taken a patient with Lou Gehrig's disease uh, generated patient-specific iPS cells, and then demonstrated using techniques that have been pioneered by uh, work from Tom Jessel and Hinnick Victorly and others, the directed differentiation into both motor neurons and glia. And there's a, a tremendous biology that's grown up uh, around the work of Cleveland and Maniatis and Goldstein and, and Egan and others that suggests that there's two processes at work here in ALS. There's both a homicidal tendency on the part of the motor neurons to not survive, but interestingly, there's also, I'm sorry, a, a suicidal tendency. There's this homicidal tendency of the glia to liberate toxic factors which affect uh, accelerated motor neuron death. And working with Lee Rubin, Kevin's group is now configuring drug screens screens that would antagonize this toxic factor, but also improve the survival of the motor neurons directly. 
And it's through these kinds of strategies that one would anticipate harnessing the value of these patient-specific iPS cells in the drug discovery program. We have collaborated with Sandra Riom's group. Uh, Sandra recently moved from Children's Hospital to children, uh, in Boston to ch uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. But um, we generated iPS cells from individuals with Down syndrome, and they carry the trisomy 21. Sandra's work has been asking a question about this fascinating observation in individuals with Downs that even though they have a childhood predisposition to certain leukemias, they tend to have a reduced lifetime incidence of solid tumors. And she's related this to the uh, restrictions on neoangiogenesis in individuals with Downs, and she's reproduced that in a mouse model that carries the Down syndrome critical region 1 gene. This is a, a protein that acts as a, a negative regulator of calcineurin-mediated angiogenic signaling. And what we did together with Sandra was to create tumors, teratomas, from normal individual iPS cells as well as those from individuals with Down syndrome, and then demonstrate by quantitative assessment of the microvascular density that the Down's tumors could not support the same degree of new vessel growth providing a, uh, a, a per perhaps substantiation of her observation that attempts to explain why there might be reduced solid tumor formation in Downs individuals. So these are just two examples where the iPS cells are giving us insights into these two different disease conditions. Now, what I want to talk about is a couple of stories where we've, we've started to learn some very interesting fundamental principles of reprogramming, and the first is the relationship between telomerase and telomerase function, known to be critical for cellular immortalization, and the reprogramming process itself. What has been known is that the cocktail of four transcription factors activate an entire network of genes that are required for pluripotency, including the reactivation of the catalytic subunit of telomerase. Here are just uh, six different examples where the fibroblast, which is uh, absent expression of telomerase has reactivated the expression in the reprogrammed state. You can also see this above by telomere length analysis that the rather shortened telomeres of the fibroblasts are regrown with reprogramming. Now this mimics what's been observed in somatic cell nuclear transfer where one can actually reactivate the telomerase machinery through reprogramming and, and lead to the regrowth of telomeres. Now, with iPS cells, what we've been able to do is literally subclone the fibroblasts and demonstrate in three independent subclones that the telomeres will regrow. So the reprogramming is not simply identifying those rare cells in the population that have retained long telomeres and so therefore are more susceptible to reprogramming. The reprogramming process itself reactivates telomerase. So Sunit Agarwal in my group has been interested in asking, using a disease-specific model, whether or not the reactivation of telomerase is an essential feature of reprogramming. And for that, he turned to patients with a disease called dyskeratosis congenita, which has been linked to defects in the telomerase enzymatic machinery. And indeed, one can find mutations that influence the catalytic subunit of TERT, the RNA component TERT, or various RNA binding proteins like dyscarin, which act to bind and stabilize the core TERT. And there's some fascinating manifestations of this condition, but we are particularly interested as hematologists because we're seeing presentations in the pediatric uh, hematology clinic of bone marrow failure. So Sunit so obtained uh, fibroblasts from individuals and then asked whether or not you can indeed affect reprogramming in the absence of, uh, of bona fide telomerase activity. And here were just two of his early passage iPS clones, uh, which were derived but with low efficiency. And in this case, there was a progressive loss of telomere length from the starting fibroblast to the early isolate iPS. Now this suggested to us that you could dissociate 
the phenomenology of telomere length extension from reprogramming, and the reprogramming was in a sense independent. But as we carried these further to later passage, what we found was a restoration of telomere length, which was really quite startling to us. And so Sunit attempted to then ask questions about the mechanism of this telomere regrowth. We thought because it was a slow and steady increase rather than a saltatory dramatic increase, which might have been seen in the so-called alt strategies, what he focused on was the expression of the RNA component itself. Now, the standard view of telomerase regulation is that the RNA component is a tonically and constitutively expressed component, and that it's the catalytic subunit which is regulated. But here in the wild-type fibroblasts, we have RT-PCR measuring the amount of, of the TERC RNA component. And in two different allelic defects of the discarin RNA binding protein, that's dramatically destabilized. But what we see in the residual, I mean, the resulting IPS cell is that the expression of the RNA component is restored. Now, this suggested a upregulation of the RNA component. And so we asked what happens in wild type reprogramming. And indeed, we saw an expression above the wild type levels. And that was seen not only in IPS cells, but in human embryonic stem cells. So it suggested that the upregulation or the higher steady state expression of the RNA component was a property of the pluripotent cells. So looking at what the underlying basis of that was, Sunit and John Lowe and my group performed chromatin immunoprecipitation using antibodies against OCT4 and NANOG, here a direct reprogramming factor and NANOG being a factor that's activated as part of the pluripotency machinery. And what you can see in two different IPS isolates is indeed direct binding of these two elements of the pluripotency machinery into the locus of the RNA component itself. Now, interestingly, we still don't completely understand how this leads to the steady state increase in RNA expression because this is a very long-lived RNA. We've not been able to demonstrate by uh, runoff analysis that there is transcriptional upregulation. But what we've observed is we've looked at the other component that we've been assessing, the discarin uh, RNA itself. And indeed, what we see in now uh, three different uh, fibroblasts that carry the discarin uh, defect is that in all cases, with return to a pluripotent state, the discarin RNA is also upregulated. And by chromatin immunoprecipitation, we can show that the OCT4 and NANOG pluripotency factors bind in the locus of discarin. So we now have examples where three of the components of the telomerase machinery, the catalytic subunit, the RNA component, and the RNA binding protein uh, discarin are all upregulated. And we believe this is a novel principle of telomerase regulation in this rapidly re uh, growing pluripotent stem cell. So here is an example how a foray into disease biology has allowed us to explore and understand and make a new insight into the regulation of telomere biology. And I think these new approaches using stem cells are going to lead to even more unanticipated uh, uh, insights. So another disease that we've attempted to reprogram are mitochondrial diseases. And these are particularly amenable to an IPS approach as opposed to a nuclear transfer approach, because in nuclear transfer, you substitute the donor mitochondria for the recipient ooplasm. So this started with a patient that Sunit and I saw in the hematology clinic, a, a young girl who had had transfusion-dependent anemia of unclear etiology since birth, but at age three started presenting to our emergency room with a complex of metabolic disorders, including diabetes, pancreatic insufficiency, and lactic acidosis. The lactic acidosis suggesting to us that there might be a metabolic and mitochondrial defect. And so from the bone marrow biopsy that we performed, we uh, also used uh, PCR to look at the mitochondrial genome and indeed detected a large deletion, 
And the fact that we saw this complex of clinical symptoms as well as a mitochondrial defect nailed the diagnosis as this rare Pearson's marrow pancreas syndrome. Now, this is part of the spectrum of, of mitochondrial diseases, which is really quite fascinating because these have a very pleiotrophic kind of presentation depending on the segregation of the deleted mitochondrial genome. So indeed, you obviously have a combination called heteroplasmy within this particular cell with deleted coexisting with normal. And depending on how they segregate, there's just stochastic variation in the inheritance patterns. So this patient, unfortunately, had received a very, very heavy burden of deleted mitochondria in her hematopoietic stem cell compartment. So we asked whether we could reprogram from these marrow fibroblasts. And indeed, once again, at low efficiency, Sunit was able to isolate iPS cells, which he could demonstrate carried the deletion. He could also quantify the degree of heteroplasmy, so the, not only the number of cells, but the percentage of the deleted chromosome. And what he observed over time, which was quite fascinating, was a passage-dependent loss of the deleted mitochondrial genome. Now, by the time he had made this observation, he was already starting to do functional analyses of these, of these cells. And he got to the point where he was able to subclone. And I should point out that because the retroviral integrations for the reprogramming act as a unique genetic mark, so we know that these are all uh, clonally related. This isn't a combination population where subclones are, are being spit out, but rather they all carry the same genomic integrations. So by the time he got to subcloning, he was able to isolate essentially completely purged what would be mitochondrial uh, normal uh, cell types. So what he was able to show by just cell growth, measuring colony area over time, was that these purged iPS cells would grow much more robustly than those that carried a significant burden of deleted mitochondria. And when he differentiated these into hematopoietic tissue, the tissue that was most markedly defective in this patient, what he saw, even with cells that had already only about 10% deleted mitochondria, that the purged ones had, in fact, more robust, more, more robust blood potential. So this suggested to us that simply culturing iPS cells affected a purging of this deleted genome, which was a very exciting prospect for us because it creates patient identical normal cell types. So as we were considering how we might turn these purged normal iPS cells into tissues that could be uh, considered for transplantation for this patient's uh, anemia, unfortunately, she succumbed to H1N1 flu in our ICU. But this is a general strategy for thinking about an approach to mitochondrial diseases. So there are conditions that we have found difficult to model by IPS reprogram. And one such condition is Fanconi's anemia. This is another one of the congenital bone marrow failure syndromes, which also has attendant with it a variety of other developmental defects, including skeletal abnormalities. It's well known as, a, uh, as one of the hypersensitivity to DNA damaging agent syndromes. And this is related to defects in a core pathway that senses DNA damage, the Fanconi pathway. And it's diagnosed clinically and shown in murine knockout models that this hypersensitivity to DNA damaging agents can be detected by looking at chromosomal breakage. And what's fascinating is that there have been a number of knockout models in the mouse which don't mimic the development of human marrow failure. When you look very hard, you can see that there are hematopoietic stem cell defects, there are defects in number and competitive engraftment, but they don't appear to develop the same type of anemia. So for that reason, there's been a lot of interest in generating humanized models. And yet when Juan Carlos Espisua Belmonte's lab attempted to reprogram Fanconi tissue, and this has been replicated independently by a number of groups, these cells are markedly resistant to reprogramming. And what they published was that one had to perform gene repair in the fibroblasts 
affecting essentially a normal fibroblast phenotype in order to generate the reprogrammed cells. There's since been reports at scientific meetings that some groups using an enhanced efficiency of reprogramming have been able to affect IPS Fanconi cells. But given the resistance, what Osmin Tulpale and my group did was ask whether we could model Fanconi anemia now using SHRNA-mediated gene knockdown. And so this is just an alternative strategy for using embryonic stem cells. Here he engineered into this short uh, hairpin vector the knockdown of the FANC D2, here now quite effective at high multiplicities of infection, and the knockdown of the FANC A. And just quickly I'll say that by measures of uh, protein, uh, both immunofluorescence and Western, we affected a very nearly complete knockdown. And then he could show that the embryonic stem cells had the same sensitivity to DNA damaging agents, and they generated these complex radial chromosomes so that they mimicked the cellular phenotype of the disease. And then by directing the differentiation of these embryonic stem cells into embryoid bodies and assessing their colony forming activity to look at hematopoietic potential, what he could show by a number of assays was that they in fact showed a deficiency of hematopoiesis, both by CD45 positive hematopoietic quantification, the expression of known markers of the myeloid lineage, as well as defects in the ability to form myeloid colony forming cells. So here's an independent strategy where we've had trouble modeling the disease using IPS cells, but we've been able to make insights into very early hematopoietic defects using the knockdown of the Fanconi anemia genes in human embryonic stem cells. And then my last example is one where, once again, we see a different and perhaps advantageous modeling of a human disease using embryonic stem cells. And that condition is Fragile X syndrome. And this is a well-known, very common form of, of genetic mental retardation that involves the silencing of a gene that carries a triplet repeat in its 5 prime untranslated region. And Nassim Benvenisti's group, indeed a graduate student, Achia Erbach, who worked with Nassim generated a embryonic stem cell from fragile X embryos that were diagnosed through pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. And what they showed was that this FMR1 gene is expressed in the embryonic stem cells, but undergoes differentiation dependent silencing. So that fibroblasts that are derived from in vitro differentiation have now undergone active gene silencing. This mimics what's been observed in human development, where samples of chorionic villus tissue of the early developing fragile X individual express the FMR1 gene, but by the time the individual has, uh, has matured, there's active silencing of the FMR1 gene. And there's fabulous new work suggesting the relevance of, the, uh, of this FMRP in the neural synapse to act as a regulator of RNA expression, and in particular, perhaps a tonic decrease in the expression of the metabotrophic glutamate receptor, which is very exciting because there are drugs that antagonize this receptor, and these are now in clinical trials. So Akia, working on this as a graduate student, then came to my lab as a postdoc and asked first whether or not one could use IPS cells to mimic this condition. So what he asked first was, what is the expression of the FMR gene in both here the control embryonic stem cells, but wild-type fibroblasts and IPS cells, and it's indeed all expressed. But in fact, it's not expressed as expected from three different patient fibroblasts. And then the question is, is this locus reactivated by the reprogramming process, the way the entire rest of the genome is reset? And indeed, across uh, about a dozen different clones from three different individuals, in no case have we seen the reactivation of this silenced locus. Now, it's not to say that if one didn't use some alternative strategy, one couldn't reactivate the locus. But using current methodology for IPS-based reprogramming, this locus, almost alone in the genome, 
remains resistant to the reprogramming process. So it must be densely heterochromatinized, and indeed we show it's methylated and carries silencing histone modifications, and that remains resistant to the global epigenetic modeling that otherwise goes on with reprogramming. And so here is an example where if your interest is to study the mechanisms of the dynamic transcriptional silencing that occurs at this locus during human development, one should use the embryonic stem cell model because the iPS cell model won't reactivate the locus. So another example of a way of using pluripotent cells to model disease is the resource of preimplantation genetic diagnosis which generates embryos that would be discarded as medical waste, but through work primarily done at the Reproductive Genetics Institute in Chicago, there's now dozens of different genetic conditions that have been reduced to embryonic stem cells. Now, unfortunately, because of problems with the informed consent that was used for all of these many cell lines, they've not received approval under the new NIH policy. And so what we're hoping is that more groups will step forward with properly constructed consents. And indeed, we've begun at Children's Hospital. In just a small way, we've now isolated three PGD-ES lines from the conditions listed here, and we hope that that number will grow over time. And I think we're going to find examples where having both the embryonic stem cell side by side with the iPS cell is going to allow us new insights into disease. So let me summarize the first part of the talk that um, iPS cells do enable a wide array of in vitro models and currently they're most useful as tools for research and are finding their way into the drug discovery pipeline. We have many, many issues that remain to be faced before we can be comfortable that these cells will be ready for any kind of cellular therapy. We appreciate that it requires a very prolonged culture to generate these cells and characterize them. And there's emerging evidence that this prolonged period of culture can lead to genetic as well as epigenetic instability. We have to refine methods for gene repair so that we can exploit the strategy of combining gene repair and cell therapy. And ultimately, we need to get better at the directed differentiation because the production of cell types that could be effective in a, in a transplantation model remains, once again, a challenge. I think I've pointed out that there are going to be diseases that are not amenable to modeling with iPS cells and for which embryonic stem cells or other traditional models may be more effective. And I want to leave you with the notion that embryonic stem cells remain essential tools for research, alternatives in some cases, and perhaps preferen preferential sources in others. And in the, in the second half of my talk, I'm going to bring us back to this notion that nuclear transfer as an approach to reprogramming may yet teach us important lessons that will improve our ability to generate IPS. So the question that I'll spend the remaining amount of time on is, is this, this important one. Um, for determining whether iPS cells are really equal to ES cells. Um, we know that reprogramming um, creates a generic iPS cell, which in the optimal circumstance, when one starts from mouse embryo fibroblasts, when one can select for reporter genes, when one can characterize the cells by blastocyst complementation and germline transfer, that the generic ideal iPS cell is in fact functionally and molecularly indistinguishable from embryonic stem cells. But in practice, it's actually quite different. And we've recently published, as well as, uh, as Alex Meissner and Catherine Plath's labs, that you can get frozen in intermediate states along the reprogramming process, and that these intermediate states can look very similar and even function to some degree as pluripotent cells. And then under some circumstances, one can convert these intermediate states to a fully reprogrammed state by uh, interventions that, that minimize residual demethylation. And what's been emerging in the literature is the notion that in uh, various isolates of iPS cells, there does tend to be a residual 
measure of gene expression from the donor tissue. And this is something that we hypothesize in practice really represents a memory, an epigenetic memory, something superimposed on the DNA that is a memory of the tissue of origin. So I'm going to discuss how we've explored this, this, this issue. And it starts with a very close collaboration between my lab and that of Andy Feinberg. And Andy's group, together with Rafa Irizarry at Hopkins, has pioneered the development of a, a, an array-based method to assess methylation across the genome. They call this method CHARM. And on the array is represented 4.6 million CPG sites. So it's comprehensive for CPG methylation across the genome, but it's importantly missing the non-CPG methylation. And by comparing differences between fibroblasts and iPS cells, we've been able to identify a large set of differentially methylated regions, which we call reprogramming DMRs, reprogramming associated differentially methylated regions. Here's just one such region in the goosecoid locus, where you see in brown is the parental fibroblast, and in red is the mean measure of methylation in the iPS locus. And you see this region is affected by demethylation during reprogramming. And one can take this array-based method and then independently validate these loci using pyro sequencing. So here you see just across this nine different iPS cells as well as three ES cells that the locus is demethylated in the pluripotent state and it's methylated in the fibroblasts. So if one uses these differentially methylated regions, the reprogramming differentially methylated regions, you can actually cluster different tissues. So these reprogramming DMRs will faithfully separate liver from spleen from brain, which tells us that those regions, even in the fibroblast, that are reset during the return to pluripotency are those regions that are intrinsic to cellular and tissue identity. Now, what we then focused on were not the 98% of those regions that get faithfully reset, but we focused on the 2% that were consistently different between ES and IPS cells. And indeed, this is just one such region uh, here in this phosphatase locus that by pyrosequencing across these nine IPS cells remains methylated in the IPS, but is not then reset to an ES-like state. Now, this was a curiosity that some loci appeared to not be reset to their ES-like state. We published this in Nature Genetics. It essentially suggests that there are differences between IPS and ES cells where there's a tendency towards residual hypermethylation at these loci, and this has been independently confirmed from Kunzang's group at UCSD. So the question is, what's the significance, if any, of these few residual regions of hypermethylation? So we decided, instead of trying to ask this question in the more genetically complex human cells, we returned to the mouse. And this is the work of Kitwa Ng, working with a postdoc, Kitai Kim, in my group, and we're asking for a very comprehensive functional and molecular comparison of a variety of different pluripotent stem cell types. And I should mention with great gratefulness that this work has in part been funded by funds received through the stimulus uh, package from NHLBI. So what we did is we started with a mouse model of thalassemia. Now, our initial intent was to assess whether any one of these pluripotent stem cells would be a better resource for generating engraftable blood tissues. But what we found was ultimately interesting in the short run, and we focused on this in vitro observation. So initially, uh, my postdoc Kit Kitai came to me because he was trying to make blood from the iPS cells that he had made from the fibroblasts of this mouse and the story will unwind. But suffice it to say that we ended up making all of these different embryonic, nuclear transfer embryonic, and two different tissue source iPS cells, all from the same mouse. 
And then we qualified these for expression of all the pluripotency markers and the ability to make teratomas. So these were all pluripotent stem cells. And then we put them through these assays of differentiation because it was stimulated by the fact that our initial studies suggested the fibroblast iPS cells didn't make very good blood. So this is what we saw. Kitai came to me and he said, I've made a whole bunch of clones of fibroblast iPS cells and I'm not getting any blood in vitro. And in comparison, the nuclear transfer reprogrammed cells from the same fibroblast donors made very robust blood, suggesting a different degree of reprogramming. So what we did was we returned and we asked, if we made the iPS cells from the blood rather than the fibroblast, would we see a different result? And indeed, you do. So these suggested that the source of the tissue was important for the ultimate potential of these reprogrammed cells to make blood in vitro. So then he asked, well, is there an opposite predisposition? And so he directed the development of osteogenic tissue, a mesenchymal lineage that's related to the fibroblast. And he saw that in these circumstances, the fibroblast IPS derivatives made more robust uh, alizarin red osteogenic colonies than the blood-derived IPS. And this was seen whether you did direct quantification of calcium deposition or the measurement of various bone-specific genes. So there appeared to be a predisposition to return to the tissue of origin. And so we performed this global charm-based methylation analysis. We asked whether or not we could see residual signals of the tissue of origin by methylation. And so using clustering, what we noticed was that the nuclear transfer embryonic stem cells by their methylome clustered with the embryo-derived stem cells and distinct from the blood-derived IPS and the fibroblast IPS. So by methylation signatures, we could distinguish these various pluripotent cell types. Now, if you simply take the top 24 differentially methylated regions and you do a literature search and you say, what are these genes linked to, 11 of the 24 <coughs> show literature evidence of involvement in hematopoietic lineages, with 10 of the 11 showing residual hypermethylation in the fibroblast-derived iPS cells, and three of the 24 are linked to osteogenic lineages, and they are hypermethylated in the blood-derived iPS cells. So this suggested to us that there was residual methylation on genes that would leave a repressive signature so that fibroblast-derived IPS would have methylation of blood loci and be repressed to reform blood, and the opposite in bone. And indeed, we, we assess this computationally. So using a set of hematopoietic transcription factors, of a, essentially a gene set enrichment analysis, we asked whether they were disproportionately methylated in the fibroblast-derived iPS cells, and indeed they are, more than a random set of such factors. And indeed, the fibroblast-specific genes are also disproportionately hypermethylated in the blood-derived iPS. So this was evidence for residual epigenetic links to the tissue of origin. And indeed, this acts to restrict the alternative cell fates. Now, this was a this was a, a, a deck stacked in favor of this result, I should say, because we started from a therapeutic model. That is, we started from a mouse which was already aged and already had a disease, not unlike a model that one might use in the human. So in fact, if you're really critical, you go back and you look at the quality of the iPS cells that you can generate from an aged mouse, and they're weak, they're poor. Remember I said the generic iPS comes from a faithfully reprogrammed embryonic cell. And indeed, if you assess by blastocyst chimerism, our fibroblast derivatives don't, don't contribute very well. Although, interestingly, they do go germline. They do have germline expression, whereas the blood-derived iPS cells are better. But neither of the iPS cells are equal to the nuclear transfer ES cells. So people could criticize and say, oh, but you know, we're going to get to better iPS cells. We're going to 
you know, we're going to figure out how to make better iPS cells. So we instead turned to better iPS cells. So now we generated and brought in from collaborators a large set of pluripotent stem cells generated either from embryos via nuclear transfer from any of these tissues or iPS cells uh, generated by factors. And each of these was qualified for germline transmission. So by the most stringent criteria, these are bona fide iPS cells. Then we asked whether or not there was still a residual differential blood potential. And sure enough, if you look at the nuclear, I'm sorry, the, the neural progenitor derived iPS cells, they still make poor blood. And that's in comparison to the blood derived iPS cells or the nuclear transfer embryonic stem cells. So we then had another element in this experiment, which allowed us to do a very, very neat experiment. That is, these iPS cells were generated from a mouse that had been made from iPS cells that carried the reprogramming factors integrated in their genome and doxycycline inducible. So this mouse is quite, uh, quite a tool because you can take any tissue from this mouse culture primary cells, neural progenitors, blood, fibroblasts, and then activate the reprogramming factors by adding doxycycline and generating iPS. So these are so-called secondary iPS cells. And what that allowed us to do is the following experiment. We asked whether we could reset the memory by taking these neural progenitors through in vitro differentiation, either into neural stem cells, which we call brain, or into blood progenitors, and then through a third round of reprogramming back to iPS. And these are now iPS that we've qualified for chimerism and germline transmission. And even under these conditions, what we find is that the neural progenitor intermediate is still poor at making blood, whereas if we take it through a blood intermediate, we've now reactivated the blood potential. And then we took the, the blood poor neural cells and we treated them with chromatin modifying enzymes, trichostatin and 5-azocytidine, and we reactivated the blood potential. So the memory that's intrinsic in these reprogrammed cells isn't seen at the pluripotent state because in a pluripotent state, these cells function perfectly. But it's only when you then differentiate them back to various tissues, that these epigenetic marks reveal themselves. And this can be reset either through a serial reprogramming or through treatment with chromatin-modifying drugs, or as Conrad Hockenlinger has shown, if you serially passage these cells, you'll also extinguish some of this memory. So then we asked, is there in fact the molecular signature, if we looked at methylation across the genome, now, in these more faithfully reprogrammed cells, we were unable to distinguish the neural progenitor-derived IPS from nuclear transfer or canonical embryo-derived IPS cells, but we were still able to distinguish the blood-derived IPS. And then we were even able to look at whether or not the differentially methylated regions in the neural progenitors uh, or, the, or the fibroblasts or the bone marrow could actually take us back to their tissue of origin. And in fact, if we cluster now on the differentially methylated regions that distinguish fibroblasts and bone marrow, in fact, the iPS cells breed true. They cluster with their tissue of origin. We then took this a step further, and in work that uh, Irv Weissman, Andy Feinberg, uh, and, and our group collaborated on in generating a methylation profile of the hematopoietic series, we were able to cluster on the differentially methylated regions that distinguish lymphoid and myeloid lineages. And indeed, the iPS cells that come from myeloid lineages cluster with the common myeloid progenitor, and those that come from B lineages cluster with the lymphoid progenitor. I would argue that all of these data suggest unequivocally that despite faithful reprogramming to the pluripotent state, that the cells retain a methylation signature and a differentiation propensity that reflects their tissue of origin. This is what we've called epigenetic memory. Epigenetic memory is also seen in human iPS cells. We've taken uh, 
uh, blood, cord blood, and uh, foreskin fibroblasts. And we've generated these and taken them through hematopoietic colony activity. And in six clones, the cord blood cells do better than seven clones from different uh, keratinocytes. And yet, if you direct back to keratinocyte lineages, you tend to see a favored um, uh, 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 keratinocyte formation from the keratinocyte-derived iPS cells. So what is, what is this telling us? Uh, I, I think it's been interpreted by some as uh, some kind of an assault on iPS cells, some kind of concern about their nature. I don't think it's that. I think it's a refinement of our understanding of this reprogramming process, and I think it's a challenge in certain circumstances. For us, since we were interested in studying blood development, when we started from fibroblast-derived iPS cells, we were thwarted because they didn't make good blood. But when we use blood as a source, then we're in an advantaged position. So I think this cuts both ways. It's, it's an advantage in certain experimental contexts. It's a challenge in others. But it no, by no way reduces the value and importance of iPS cells. But it does say that under practical circumstances, these are functionally similar cells that in the generic ideal state might be identical, but that in practice we see important differences. There appears to be a hierarchy so that some tissues are more readily reprogrammed than others, and in our work we would suggest neural progenitors are more faithfully reprogrammed than blood and uh, relative to fibroblasts. We are seeing, in our own work, methylation as distinct across the epigenome, but other groups are looking at uh, microRNA profiles and histone modifications, and those are also uh, being seen in epigenetic memory. In most instances, what we understand is the technical limitations of reprogramming leave a residual of uh, a repressive, uh, in, our, in our case, methylation marks. Uh, and that, as I said, in certain circumstances, this could be an advantage or, or, or a challenge. And that we're learning how to erase this memory. We've shown a proof of principle for doing it by drugs, and Conrad Hochenliger's lab has shown that if you serially passage over time, there tends to be a homogenation of these pluripotent cell types towards a common end. But I think also a very important principle here is we've really done the first very exhaustive comparison, face-to-face, -face, of nuclear transfer reprogrammed cells and this new factor-based method for generating pluripotent cells. And by the measures that we've analyzed, nuclear transfer, in a sense, is a more ready method of getting to that pluripotent ground state. You can get there with IPS, but there are more challenges. And I think what this is teaching us is that we need to develop standardized molecular criteria for the reprogrammed pluripotent state. And if everyone's goal, at least in the pluripotent community, is to generate this unique ground state of pluripotency, the so-called naive stage of the inner cell mass, that we really need to continue to develop new and improved strategies. Let me then acknowledge uh, that our reprogramming studies were started by Inhune Park, who is now independent faculty at Yale. And the work of Kitai Kim has really been central to the studies that I've shown in epigenetic memory. Osman Tulpule was responsible for the Fanconi data. The Fragile X work was uh, Achia Erbach. We've benefited tremendously from the computational contributions of Patrick Cahan. We have terrific collaborators for our methylation analysis, collaborators in our pluripotency biology. And this work has really been a, a, a remarkable compilation of resources from NIDDK, NHLBI, uh, and the NIH Director's Pioneer Award. And I want to thank you, and I hope there are a few minutes for questions. in the aisles, uh, so please don't be shy while people are thinking. Uh, George, you showed this mitochondrial example where there seemed to be some selective pressure benefiting the loss of the deleted mitochondrial genome 
in iPS cells, and one wonders what's special about the environment of those iPS cells that didn't seem to work in the patient, because you would have loved to have seen that same yeah. selective advantage working against her anemia. Yeah, so it's really quite interesting. In fact, uh, it's, it's been observed in some patients that there is natural selection in the hematopoietic system over time, so that some patients are transfusion dependent in their youth, and they essentially grow out of it. We didn't see that in this patient. Rather, we saw that in culture. I think it was because the burden of heteroplasmy in her hematopoietic tissue was so high that she was just she was really very significantly uh, burdened by that. Uh, the question is now, and, and uh, I had a nice meeting with Torin Finkel, and the idea of how could we take the tissues from these individuals that have a high burden of heteroplasmy and make IPS in such a way that we would promote this purging? You know, could we do it in a more effective and quick way so that we could develop tissues that could be used for transplantation? The question relates to the what type of the cells of the blood is more useful to develop? Is it uh, lymphoid cells, myeloid cells, or erythrotype? Yeah, so it's a very good question. Is there any advantage of different cell types within the panoply of hematopoietic lineages? Um, Conrad Hockedlinger has a paper where they've looked at the reprogramming efficiency of, of progenitors versus more, more differentiated committed cells. And the argument in that paper is that the progenitors are a more efficient target of reprogramming. Um, and indeed, there's been thoughts in the community that maybe the hematopoietic or neural stem cells are, in fact, more amenable to reprogramming. Um, I think it's part of this general principle that is not new. It's from the era of Gurdon 40 years ago, that there's a, a, a differentiation and stage-dependent decline in the efficiency of reprogramming, in his case, by nuclear transfer in frogs but that the embryonic tissues are the most easily and faithfully reprogrammed and the more differentiated tissues are more challenging. And we're now starting to appreciate the mechanisms behind that. A short question regarding the urgency of the stem cell application. Uh, one of the areas where there is some good return of investment besides the hematopoietic stem cell is the pancreatic inner cells because of uh, cadaveric transplantation and other issues. So when do you think we might get into the clinical arena with any of the cell types besides the hematopoietic stem cells? Well, I happen to think the hematopoietic stem cell may not be the first to be in the clinic, but it's probably going to be the best once it gets in the clinic. I think that we know how to transplant hematopoietic stem cells. I think the anatomic issues are essentially uh, 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 much less of a concern with hematopoiesis than for any of these, these other tissues. But, um, I can just simply say that the community is reflecting enormous interest in the directed differentiation of pancreatic endoderm and ultimately pancreatic beta cells because they would, if, if functional and safe, could be a source for transplantation to replace cadaveric transplantation, which we, we know has some efficacy in type 1 diabetes. Um, there's an enormous interest in developing the retinal pigment epithelia or the photoreceptors. Uh, and there are sort of two different camps, uh, and, and I think there is going to be clinical applications in a variety of retinal degenerative diseases. Um, and of course, the first clinic, uh, the first FDA-approved trial is the oligodendrocyte progenitor. That's a product of human embryonic stem cells that Geron is hoping to test in spinal cord injury patients. Over here, and then over here. Wait. Hi, I'm interested in um, a technical uh, question. Have you looked at looking at the inhibitors, um, growing inhibitors with uh, the ES cells compared to the IPS cells in the mouse? Uh, you mean, you mean the, uh, the sort of uh, MAP kinase inhibitors and GSK? Yes. So Austin Smith has pioneered the concept that if one inhibits the pro-differentiation pathways, <clears throat> you favor a tendency to return to this uh, uh, embryonic ground state that's sort of the equivalent of the inner cell mass. And yes, it, um, there are now many groups that are attempting to incorporate this into the reprogramming process. There's some evidence that it, it does enhance the efficiency of reprogramming. We haven't seen that it plays any particular role in promoting the erasure, um, but, but those are efforts that are ongoing. The erasure of memory. <laughs> 
you pointed out the need to reach a more standardized IPS cell stage if you want something more similar to the NTES state. Uh, now, our ways to make these IPS cells vary considerably from one lab to the other, one method to the other. Do you know of any new procedure that would get closer to that goal? I know it, but I am not at liberty to say in this forum. Uh, <laughs> I, I think it's fair to say that um, there are, there's been a tremendous uh, investment of time and resources in trying to generate approaches to make transgene-free iPS cells, and there have been um, there there have been reports of using non-integrating episomal plasmids, non-integrating viruses, protein transduction, and the like, all of which suffer from a very significant inefficiency. Um, I have a junior colleague, Derek Rossi, who has a very exciting new platform which has been submitted for uh, publication which involves repetitive RNA transfection. And I, I think that is going to emerge as a very uh, enabling and efficient platform. Um, and we'll get to transgene-free lines. Well, there will be a reception in the NIH library immediately with the speaker, but let us thank Dr. Daly again for a stimulating presentation. Thank you.